Okay. Um, let's just start this panel, I guess, with uh, short introductions. So uh, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves and talk about how um, they became involved with the project or related to the Bro Project. I guess I should start with myself just really quickly. Um, I've been a co-PI with Robin and Vern since 2010, I think, on the Bro Project and um, have a somewhat leadership role at the Conservancy and the Bro Leadership Team um, as well. I don't know if there's any official title or anything. And so um, that's, I think that's my role. And then of course NCSA, uh, as the CISO here, we've been using Bro for, you know, I think one of the early users that were outside the lab since 2003 or so when Ashish started, actually it was even before Ashish, was John Dugan started. So that's my uh, role with the project, I suppose. Um, Vern? Um, well, I've been using Bro longer than anyone else, I think I can say. <laughs> <laughs> started working on it in uh, 1995 at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, uh, now my uh, role is as, as part of the Pro Project and uh, with Corelite, and I'm also a professor at UC Berkeley, um, currently on industrial leave. I'm Anita Nikolic. I'm a program director at the National Science Foundation. Uh, Bro is one of the awards I inherited, so I kind of manage Bro and the Bro Center of Excellence. Uh, Robin Sommer. I have been involved with Bro, I think, since 2002-ish. I um, was still a grad student in uh, Germany by, by then and later moved out to Berkeley, joining Vern's group there. Um, used Bro a long time for, as a platform for research, and, and out of that came a lot of the transition to practice work, which I started leading um, when the NSF funding for that started. And um, these days, still very my ICSI hat, but also actually spending most of my time at Corelight as the CTO. Um, Seth Hall. I started with Bro at the Ohio State University, actually slightly probably to do with uh, NCSA because I started interacting with Barlow. Jim Barlow and Ashish mm -hmm. years ago. I uh, started in 2005, shortly thereafter started bugging Robin constantly to add new features and stuff. And um, uh, yeah, just have been going since then. I started, I, I got hired by Robin at the International Computer Science Institute in 2010 when the, uh, the grant came in. And um, today I'm now 100% Corelite, but still doing lots of, of bro work. And actually, I promised Vlad today that I was going to do a commit, so I'm going to something's going out today. I don't know what it's going to be yet. But something. <laughs> Fix a comment. So, uh, so it'll be better, better than that. Uh, I'm Keith Lee High from Indiana University. Uh, I was one of the uh, I was involved in some of the research technology groups and got involved in bro and interested in it, sort of the same way that uh, Seth did through Ashish and Jim Barlow, uh, attended the first Bro workshop in, I think, 2007 at Tampa, mm -hmm. tried to run Bro for a little while, moved over to the security group in 2009 and built a couple large Bro clusters. This was, I think, right around the time that 2.0 or 2.1 had dropped, mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to be pretty aggressive in what versions we ran in production. Uh, and since we have a very large network, we started to become sort of the place where, as Seth likes to say, once a release can run on our network, it's probably going to run perfectly fine on most anybody else's network. Uh, and so that's sort of the role that I play is a place where you can push things to the limit uh, with large volumes and a very, very diverse network. Okay. Um, the project, the Bro Project, has clearly had a lot of successes over the years. Escaping DOE labs and supercomputing centers, it's used by some of the largest companies in the world, um, across many different business sectors, public, private sector as well, hundreds of universities and governments worldwide. What do you see as the biggest challenge for the project going forward? And whoever wants to take this first, we don't have to do any sort of order. I think growing the community and, and getting, <coughs> getting people to contribute uh, it, I, I know this is something that we say, I, I think it happens every year on the panel, um, but it's still something that, that we struggle with. Uh, the, the core team is, is still a relatively small team, and uh, the number of people that contribute scripts is still fairly small. 
Uh, you can search GitHub and find all kinds of little scripts that people have written, um, but getting more people to write scripts, getting people to contribute things to, uh, to, the, to the Pro Package repository, uh, and then moving toward more complex things like analyzers or, or trying to, to contribute things to the core um, and, and getting, you know, just growing the community in general and making it sustainable for the long term. I would add, that you're right, that's exactly what popped in my head. And when I did the keynote a couple of years ago and, and got the statistics on how many people have contributed to the project and how many have contributed 10 or more commits to the project, that line was hugely different. I mean, we, we really need more um, uh, energetic contributors uh, right now that that core is really very small. And, and and this is um, this is a big challenge <clears throat> because the the project's growing in all sorts of ways, and uh, those central uh, people now have lots of uh, things pulling on their time. Yeah, so I'd say um, sustainability. Obviously, as grants um, you know co come to a close, how do you sustain the software that's typical of many types of software? So I think it's a a crossroads of sustain via some kind of traditional method, subscription based, et cetera, et cetera, or, or say, you know, it's so widely used. Let's set this grand, huge vision for what Bro is going to become and kind of start over with more government money to this grander vision. What that is, only, only you can decide. But I think it's, it's a really good time now to figure that out. Yeah, it would, would have answered along the same lines. I mean, funding open source software is still a challenge, I think. I mean, we have been very fortunate with this NSF funding. Um, but as this, this second grant now comes to a close, I mean, we need to figure out a way going forward how to um, harness the community, I think, in that, in that context, too. So I'm going to skip around. There's a, there are several community questions around this, too. So maybe we dig in a little deeper here. Um, you know, somebody had asked, what does the financial future of Bro look like with, you know, as I mentioned, this current NSF Center grant running out? Um, maybe we dig into that a little. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you know, NSF's funded, I think, burn for like 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, uh, 20 15 years. probably. 15 uh, years, yeah. So, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, research and now the transition to operations. But as all good things happen in the government with, with many types of software, it's not perpetual. We, we are technically there to seed something interesting and then have it be sustainable by somebody else. Um, so that presents, um, that presents a problem with software like this. Again, I think... Um, Setting, setting a grand vision to say, you know, bro is great at doing this. We really needed to do whatever IoT or hardware detection or something, something different um, and, and setting a somewhat similar but different course to get a new stream of funding um, might be one option. Well, I mean, and there's, there's certainly the, the elephant in the room of Corelight. Like, you know, I'm paid 100% by Corelight now. So in some way, I, I could see that potentially giving the appearance of, of muddy in the water, or peeing in the pool. Um, well, but, but you should but, but add wait, something. Wait, there, there's, <clears throat> there was a, a bigger point, though, I wanted to make, that um, Corelight, like, like everything, is, is people-driven. It, it's a, it's a human-created organization, just the same as the, the core bro team was a human-created organization. And we've been fortunate enough to have a large community of people show up, and I mean, everyone here even, that has trusted us to continue creating it and continue thinking of new things to do and climbing to the top of peaks and seeing more peaks and getting to those also. Um, it's sort of, uh, because I've been thinking about this for a long time, because it's certainly a perception thing. Um, it's like, it, for anyone that, that has kids, when you have a second child, do you love the first child less? You don't. It's, it's, there's, there, maybe there's a second one, but it's still that the, the, they're both there. So I, that's the way I like to think of it, because really, I mean, we're still in the position of serving users. I mean, I like to still think of myself as the guy sitting by himself at his desk at The Ohio State University going, I don't know how to solve my problems, and I love solving those problems of, of that person sitting there that doesn't know what to do and how to solve this impossible task they've been given. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure and say that because I know that the core light certainly can, can create the wrong perception, but the child analogy works out well for me. So, I mean, so we also have this really, many of you may not be familiar with it, but we have this really 
I think, pretty successful um, NSF's uh, Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, which is based out of Indiana University, several people here at uh, Illinois are on that payroll. And that's a center, and it's kind of mushy and evolving and morphing to what the community needs out of it. But it's a center where all things security, which had really until it was set up, were kind of underground in the scientific cyber infrastructure community. All things security are kind of going through there. Something similar maybe for... Um, the operational security community could be could be thought of as, as a need, and you know if somebody was energetic enough to put something together or complement that to transition some of this you know these questions or setups or best practices that I mean certainly those are options, but it takes people with spare time to rally behind the idea um, in addition to their day jobs so I think we you know, we, we went a little bit into the role of institutions like NSF sustaining cyber infrastructure that helps create in the communities that depend on it. Um, but we haven't really answered what the financial future bro looks like, I think, because in some part we don't know. Um, we have a few hundred thousand dollars in, in this conservancy. Um, but during our peak funding, we were spending about a million dollars a year of NSF funds. You know, granted, there's university overhead and other things entangled in that. Um, but that's a big gap, you know, and this is not annual money that's renewed, you know. So some corp we've had sponsorship and, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars from Mozilla for a very specific project. Uh, Corelight has become a, a donor of the future fund, so supporting us at $100,000, I think, annually. Um, and, you know... If you look, though, on our sponsorship page, you know, not, not the workshop, not the, um, the conference, which we don't seem to have troubles getting sponsorship for just to mostly sustain the conference itself, you know, we don't have a lot of other companies coming in or other institutions donating. It's NSF, it's Mozilla, it's Corelight, and, uh, and that's going to, we have to figure out how to sustain things long term. And it's not just money, in my opinion. I think it's also resources. Too. So if, I don't know if anybody wants to follow up on that, but you know, as much as I worry about money, it's about time and people too and expertise. Well, certainly money is the gateway or a gateway to those. Yes. Time and people and expertise. It does seem to me like um, we're at this point where um, this project is becoming really valuable to enormous number of uh, entities. Um, some of which uh, I would think can uh, afford essentially to yeah let's let's invest in this as a as future technology in various ways and so I you know I would just I would want to understand for those and I'm just thinking about big companies and we know a lot of them are using bro in various ways um, to understand their uh, how they conceptualize supporting the project and you know is a hundred thousand a year from one of those companies that's easy to arrange that's not going to fit because of how the company uh, manages such expenses they have concerns about that whatever I, I think the the bro leadership team would really like to understand uh, the, that landscape so you know if you're at one of those uh, at, at some uh, institute that that level of support would be uh, conceptually not not, not a big burden for your institute, then uh, I think we'd all really like to hear, okay, what does that look like? How do we actually make that happen? So I'm going to skip around a little bit here back to um, a non-audience question. Uh, I think we'll kind of touch back on some of these related topics later. Um, how has the bro user changed over the years? Well, it used to be all higher ed. <laughs> it, well, it was national labs and higher ed. I mean, you, you even at the, the events, it was like, I don't know. Well, well, okay, the one in Tampa, right? That was, that was all higher ten, ed. That was ten year, yeah, 10 years ago now. Yeah, it was all higher ed and national labs. And then the ones in Berkeley that you organized, still, still that. It wasn't until 2010 that a few companies showed up. Or was that? Two, no, that was 2011. There wasn't anything in 2010. Let, let me ask this. Who here is from higher ed? <laughs> okay. So I would say maybe half. Is, is <coughs> yeah. 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 
I was about third last year. Different locations bring different. Yep. Yeah. So in some sense, I think we have we have been able to keep the higher ed community yeah. like a core part of our. So we've been able to keep the higher ed community a core part of our community, but but um, fortunately also been able to grow the community beyond that into into new spaces. And I think that's probably the the major change. And and I think it's it's one that introduces some tensions too, because I would if the Nita can comment more so, but I, I could imagine if we remained a essentially higher ed resource that fits more directly with facets of the NSF's mission, and uh, yet it, it is uh, the future. I see the the higher ed is is ultimately really a pretty small part of the borough community because I think it's it's become clear over the past few years that the non higher ed, the just commercial use, is is potentially enormous and already big. And so that's one of the things we have to figure out is, is how to uh, keep both of those communities, well, keep the higher ed community vibrant and grow, grow the second one, um, which will introduce some tensions, both just in terms of funding model and also priorities. Do you think that the change in users has um, changed what people care about and how they use Bro? Are they more focused on the logs now than the scripting language? Is integration with other tools more important? Is performance and clusterization bigger? Um, some places like Amazon he have even gone so far as to essentially disable the cluster mode and just run a bunch of things independently. I think that's the case. I think in interestingly, uh, it would be interesting to get more incident responders involved, um, to have more people. Sometimes I worry that there's a belief that you have to know how to write scripts or, or be able to write C to, to, to contribute things. Uh, and I think it would be really interesting to hear more from people <coughs> about how they actually use the log data for incident response and, and within, their in, with, uh, you know, within their industry or within their company um, and, and get a better sense of what people are doing with it. And that helps to figure out what, what the project needs to do, you know, what directions are the right directions. Uh, and, and maybe lowers the bar a little bit for ways that people can contribute and support uh, just by talking about and sharing what they're doing with the data that Bro is producing. I, I, sorry. <clears throat> I'd say that, that fundamentally uh, that what people are using it for and what they want have, haven't really changed that much. I mean, years ago when I first talked to Ashish, he was like, I've got all these logs and they're great, you know, and it was like, it was, that was it. And it, it, it's like there's, it's almost like writing a, a script in Bro is really only an ends to a me. And you don't write a script because you enjoy, it, it's like, like any program, you don't, sorry, typically you don't do programming <laughs> because you just want to get those lines in a file. You actually are putting them there for some other reason. Um, and, and bro scripts are the same way. So everyone is, the, that's why the bro package manager, again, is so great because it really is getting more to that where you're like, I just want the functionality. I, I, like, the fact that I got there this way is, is cool and it's fine and it's nice to have this abstracted infrastructure that I can get a bit of functionality from someone else and run it. But it's just an end to a mean. And the, the logs, though, have always been sort of the center shining star, even... I don't even think Ashish complains about the logs anymore after they ch changed them in 2.0. <laughs> okay. Um, here's a, it's sort of an amalgamation of a couple of different questions that came in from uh, the community. What are your thoughts about using either external libraries like NDPI or developing um, more signature detection for protocols for which Bro does not plan to implement analyzers in the near future. So detecting without fully a, attaching an analyzer for a, this long tail of protocols. I would like um, you to answer, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer the first part and I'll leave the second to you. <clears throat> um, so about the first part, the, the, the third party libraries. Um, I think it, it kind of circles back to what, what we were saying during the, the broad map. I think we, we, we do use third party software, but often not as the, the directly, I would say. So often like a layer lower. And that has served us pretty well, I think, by, by giving us a solid foundation to build something on which we then can tailor. 
it's often hard to directly use um, existing components, even like if it's in the right domain, like if it's a DPI library or something, because um, on a technical level, making them really fit into the, into the data um, flow and the control flow um, in, in a high performance setting is challenging. And, and, and um, I think there's a reason why, like if you look at the major IDSs, for example, open source IDSs, there's hardly any reuse of functionality. And that is just because on a technical level, it's very, very challenging. Um, and it would be nice if you could use more, and I would be happy to do it, um, but, but it needs thought. One, one thing to add to that is there's both the technical complexity and there's the architectural coherence. And depending on, on, on the library, um, and, and well, Seth can comment further about, for example, signature matching on, on analyzed protocols. That um, doesn't really fit with the model of what Bro wants to deliver. It wants to deliver um, decisions that are made on rich semantic information, not on a lower level uh, information. There's still tons of utility in doing such signature matching. And so, you know, for those things, I would like to see them fit into essentially like the plug-in framework where, where there is not, it's not a distortion of the underlying architecture. They're still accommodated as a thing on the side um, uh, to get that utility. Not saying that that's necessarily easy for juicy ones that one would like, but that's how you'd like to see it uh, done. And, and the last thing I'd add on that, and then I'll turn it over to Seth, is um, from my perspective, we're here now today, 20 plus years after the original design, because that architecture more or less is right. And so, um, you know, I'm really reluctant to distort it uh, because I think it has served us very well. So now here's where I mostly disagree with <laughs> part partially. Me too, a little. Um, <laughs> so I, I view Bro slightly different than that. Bro, uh, uh, the, the way I've always approached it is it's a way of taking network traffic and saying that network traffic by itself is not very helpful. Um, just volume and it's messy and whatever. Uh, so you're saying, okay, well then let's turn it into something helpful. And you, if you're going to convert data from one format to another, which is essentially packets to bro logs is, is a data transform in some ways. And what you want to do is have the highest fidelity to say as true to, to the data that was there that you can. Um, I think that absolutely putting a thing in that says, we didn't analyze this protocol. Like, I don't think like the service field, if we keep that in the con log to say, look, we attach these analyzers, this is what it appears to be. But add another field that says, this is the signature detected protocol. So it, it, the analyst is then saying, that gives me full context. I know what happened. I know where the data was derived from. It's another itty, like another little tweak to the log to like, oh, okay. Huh. That's kind of the way I view it, where it's, it's sort of like, not giving that information is, um, is, is detrimental in the sense that we could have given it. Like, we could have run signatures and identified, you know, that this was some protocol we don't support. Oh, all right, I'll push back a little on that. So you, you don't want absolute perfect fidelity. That's PCAP, right? So you actually want to distill down. You want to throw away a bunch of information. Yeah, yeah. I don't care what the IP ID was. I don't care what the, you know, X, the, the, reserved bits were set in those headers. You know, there's just a ton of stuff I don't care about. Um, there is a lot of stuff that I do, and, and I would like it presented to me in a, in a form that is digestible. Yeah. For signatures, um, it really depends on the nature of the signature, and, and you know, I'm okay with, 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 with signatures. There's a lot of utility, but, but I want it to be something that the consumer of it understands, fits into their mental model of what they're getting. <laughs> and so, um, you know, a mental model of this is a sequence of bytes seen in a packet is kind of at odds with Bro's notion of you can't even tell there were packets. And so I, that's sort of the architectural mismatches that I'd like to avoid. Well, I, I conveniently, um, there, this, this already exists sort of, but it's a little bit broken. We still need, to, there's some brokenness with it, but it already exists and it turns out you could do it as like a package anyway. So it doesn't even need to be a part of Bro. We could just if you want that, you load a package, yeah, it adds great. a field that's to con.log. So really it's kind of like the model wins out in the end because it was like the model enabled this. Mm. Even if 
there's a disagreement internally and we're like, well, we're not going to add that to the core by default, but if it gets added as a package, fine, who cares? That's yep. great. That's yep. awesome that you solved the problem. Because the, 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 appro the approach I always take is no matter how weird or awkward or something, because I've done tons of weird and awkward stuff that actually both of you have told me not to do, and, <laughs> yep. but, it, but it worked, and I found an incident. So anyone out there that is doing anything that feels weird or awkward or wrong, if you found an incident with it that you didn't find from not doing it, justified. There's nothing else that needs, there's zero other justification. I, I want to see some sort of t-shirt for Seth next year, something about being weird and awkward and wrong. <laughs> and just throwing it out there. And justified, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, weirdness and awkwardness is justified. Yes, but it's true. Like, you know, if, if, if you found an incident you wouldn't have found, like, there's, I don't care what you did. I, I caught... <laughs> So this, I don't know who did this, but um, in years ago, I caught thousands of IRC bots with ngrep. I'm not going to recommend anyone here run ngrep, but if you find incidents, I'm not going to say don't run ngrep. Like that's a great idea. Run it if you're finding stuff with it. It's awesome. So the pragmatist. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Pragmatic. Okay. I'm going to go back. This one. Most of these uh, submissions had overlap, and so I've kind of amalgamated a few questions in one. But this, this is a very specific set of related questions I'll read out exactly. And so um, it goes, it would appear a significant majority of the core bro development team is now employed by a private company, Corelight. Can someone from the project team, other than a Corelight employee, explain to the community what assurances we have that the strategic directions behind the open source project won't be unintentionally biased? I so guess that's me. Cut, there's, the, there's the elephant, I guess, right? Yep. <laughs> um, so that leaves, I guess, I'll take a first stab because I feel like some of this is, is my responsibility to answer with the role in the leadership team, the conservancy. Um, and then... I think I have to hand off to, to Keith for the non-core light uh, <laughs> person. But um, part of this, the reason that we set up the conservancy um, a long time ago, that relationship and, and joining their foundation, was to put these, uh, to make the commitment device essentially to adhere to our principles. As we we're talking about, you know, on the team, different people talked about startups, other things. We really wanted to to make that, I think, or at least that's part of the reason. I mean, there are several reasons we wanted to join the foundation. But the Conservancy provides us that third opinion out there, the kind of watching over, hey, guys, you should be a little careful here. Um, the leadership team itself, the way that we have uh, in our charter with the Conservancy set it up, does not allow a majority of the leadership team uh, to be from uh, Core Light, which is or any one single institution, not, it's not correlate specific. And that's part of the reason why we, we have a very large leadership team. We have nine people on our leadership team. Um, one of the practical things we do is, um, if it is relevant in, in a discussion, um, correlate people usually, Vern's the first one to recuse himself. I don't have to ask. Uh, we've had a few of those discussions where, you know, um, uh, whether it's on presentations uh, for BroCon or other things where we've, we've done that. And so those, those are some of the structural things that I see that um, we've put in there um, with the Conservancy. I don't know if Keith has anything to add really there. I, I think uh, another way that, uh, another part of this is, is simply having a dialogue with the community at large uh, and, and um, Making sure that if people do have concerns, that they're that they feel comfortable about bringing them to to the leadership team, um, and and sort of that that is part of just building a trust within the community. The the, the establishment of Corelight was obviously a, a pretty significant change, uh, and it's going to take a little bit of time for uh, I think for everyone to to feel comfortable that that this is indeed that everyone is operating out of the out of the best interests of the Bro project itself. Uh, and not trying to focus solely upon uh, upon the for-profit side of things. Um, I can say that in practice, you know, as as Adam noted, you know, the SSC helps a lot with making sure that 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 we stay focused uh, on the leadership team side, as keeping in mind that this is a nonprofit and that this is the bro community side of things. Uh, and and I know, you know, 
there, there is a lot of internal discussion about making sure that, that we don't even give the appearance of conflict of interest, um, and, and that's both in structure and in practice. But a lot of this is going to be just dialogue. Um, if, if people have concerns, they, um, I think it's much more important that they bring it to us uh, so that we can hash through it instead of being turned off and just quietly turning away from the project. I think another thing, you know, I mean, it's certainly true. The technical leadership is, is in people affiliated with Corelight right now. And I think one thing may be practical that we, we've been doing unconsciously more and more of, but maybe we could strive to even do more is we've been, I don't know if people have noticed, we've been using, trying to use the bro development list and these open channels more rather than just like the internal email address that we had for the the NSF funded project and we're trying to push more of these things there. And I think I think that's also important for us to do is is to have as many of these technical discussions going forward mm -hmm. in the open to keep the trust of the community. And I think that's going to be critical too. And does anybody else have anything they want to add? I know people want that person wanted to hear from non correlate, but I think it, I, I would like to hear from um, everyone if they have an opinion, I guess. I'll just say that um, you, you framed how, uh, how I view it as well, both the, the mechanisms and the, uh, the, the particular key thing, like you're, you're commenting about, um, you know, let's, let's have a dialogue. Let, let's, let's hear the community's you know, concerns when they want to point to something and say, well, I'm worried about X, Y, Z. Let's, let's hear it, you know. And, and talk with whoever you're comfortable talking with. And it might be one of the Corelite based members or it might not, and I, whatever. And I think the leadership team really wants to get this right. And there's also the conservancy leadership you can talk to, too. If Yep, yep, outside the leadership yeah. team, too. Karen Sandler. <clears throat> uh, there's a second part to this question, which I think is interesting, and, I, uh, and I'd like to hear more from the panel. Assuming Bro will always remain a free open source project. I think that's a good assumption. It's my assumption, and it's more than that. How does the project leadership team intend to demonstrate adequate diversity across those in charge of major directional decisions for the project? Um, maybe I can say, like, like from the from the development perspective and the and the um, um, technical side there. So, I mean, actually, Adam's point of about being open, I think, is an important one. So, so um, as we make, make major, as we do major technical decisions, or come up with designs or, or visions for going forward, um, um, I, we have been trying hard to put that out in the open, and, and we probably can can even do even more there. Um, at the same time, I, I would hope, and that's something we haven't seen much in the in the past, that that the community maybe is chiming in a bit more as well. So, if if there is a design on the Broadf mailing list. Um, and, and we seek input, um, it's often the, the responses that come are often like, well, the, 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 the rather small, close group of people um, who are working on it. But it would be a, a immensely helpful to have like, like um, more eyes on this stuff and, and have additional opinions and, and even counter arguments why something we are envisioning might not be the right way to go. Um, so I think that would be really helpful for us. Anyone else? I, I would say to the bro list, it, most of the time the proposals, as far as I can think, probably almost all of the proposals that have been put forward on the bro dev mailing list have come out of the core people, mm -hmm. but it does not have to be that way. And, and I think it would be a good kind of problem to have a whole bunch of proposals that people are, that, that we have to sort through uh, that are coming from outside of the community. Um, that, that's going to help, again, that's going to help to determine what the direction is of the project. Uh, but if, if people, you know, and, you know, people should feel free and comfortable to, to put their proposals out in public on the list and, and let's hash out whether it's right for the, for the group or not. Uh, and even if, you, even if everything that the proposal wants doesn't, uh, doesn't happen, uh, you may get part of, part of it. Okay. I'm going to ask one little practical question. Um, and this is actually to the audience. Um, we're thinking about where, how many events to host, where to have them each year. I'm just curious, how many people are not reached by Twitter or the mailing list if we were to do surveys? Are there any people that came here and don't 
ever see the mailing list or Twitter? One person? Okay. How did you find out about Brocon, if you don't mind? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> That's a good reason. Okay. So, that, the, so you need a town crier, too. Yeah, yeah, town, town crier. Uh, I'll go out and yell in the quad, and, that'll be, and we'll send surveys out to Twitter and the mailing list, because there are going to be, you know, both for the name change, we'll have something there, and we'll, we'll also, as we start looking at future events, you know, we have all sorts of different ideas from people. Um, I think for this last few minutes, I think uh, about five to seven minutes, maybe I'll just open it up to the audience to see if there are any other questions. We're going to end this a little early so people can make flights. But anybody? Sure. And there's a guy with the microphone running around, so don't just wait a second. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, so traditionally, Bro has has been looking at, at border security, and um, as we saw in the presentation by VJ and uh, and the rest there, there's there's movement into the embedded market and an internal enterprise security. So, is there any effort or thought on moving in different different fundamental areas? I suppose you could say. Uh, for for uh, for bro. I I wouldn't say say formally. Um, there's certainly a lot of. There's starting to be more protocol analyzers. I mean that that's where it really comes in is is protocol analyzers because suddenly if you can understand protocols that are used internally, I mean, Ixie had that grant yeah. forever that was like the enterprise traces one. Though the. There was actually, while you're on that, there was a question that came in about people wondering about Internet of Things and low-level yeah. protocols, you know, how, how to handle things that aren't IP-based. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we had a really long, horrible discussion about that last night. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was enjoyable, but it was horrifying. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to protocols. So, you know, it, SMB was clearly a big one there because if you're in a Microsoft shop, like, Everything happens over that protocol, mm. just about. Um, but there's lots of other ones still. I mean, uh, Vlad did Kerberos a couple of years ago, which was you know another sort of big internal one. And um, there's other ones I'm not even thinking of. Radius. Uh, Radius, yeah, that's DHCP. another Vlad. <laughs> another Vlad one, DHCP. DHCP. Did, did you write DHCP too? Uh, in yeah, yeah, yeah. And some, um, didn't Martin contribute um, the VNC, yep. essentially? Yep. Uh, yep, yeah, and RDP. So there, there are a lot of these kind of things showing up. I mean, I think uh, def if you're going to go the direction of, like, Internet of Things, that requires an awful lot of definition because in many cases, everything just runs over HTTP. <laughs> and you're like, yes, it, it is a computer that's that big, a little tiny thing, but it still is running a web server and they're doing rest requests. So it's like, you know, even explaining like what Internet of Things is would needs definition. Um, but a lot of it I, I think comes down to, to protocols that are supported, certainly. And I'll just re return to the point I made earlier that this, we need this from the community. You know, people who are grappling with these protocols, I, I think there's so many of them and, and it's not feasible to develop analyzers for them without rich illustrative traces of them. That uh, if your hope is that the project's just going to materialize these, uh, unfortunately, I, I just don't see that happening at scale. It'll happen pointwise. And so it's, it's really something where those who have the resources to tackle the analyzers and then contribute can really help the community. <coughs> So, so as turnabout, can I get a shirt made for you that says "Rich Illustrative Traces"? <laughs> I heart. I would like that. Rich yeah, I'll wear that. <laughs> You'd be like, "That's been my life for 20 yeah. years yeah. or so." <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, uh, last year during the panel, um, I had asked a question about um, people who were new to bro, um, but bro from the operational side and how what the best way for them to get started. And uh, the response was, you know, tried bro.org and learn how to do bro scripting, which seemed like a bit of a miss at the time. Um, because it, I, I think it's really hard for people in that uh, operational perspective to start with um, scripting, right? As, as the gentleman in the end said, there are a lot of people that are very interested in what can I do with the bro logs first? I want to try, um, I want to try that out first. I want to see what I can get out of the box, and then, you know, eventually go into bro scripting. So, kind of asking the question again um, from that perspective. How to? What is the best way to, for people to get started if they were really at ground zero knowledge? I, I oh, sorry. Did you want to? Um, I, I think what would be interesting is uh, to see if there's a way to get people to share the tools that they are the little tools that they're creating. Um, Mark Krentz's uh, presentation on mm -hmm. Bach. Um, she, you know, it would be useful to share those kind of tools, um, and and it might be interesting to think about a, a forum that's. Um, you know, that's outside of the normal bro mailing list that is a, maybe a, another list that's more focused primarily on the logs themselves. Um, uh, those would be two ways, but especially everyone, probably everyone has little shell aliases that they've written that, that do things. Um, turn those little shell aliases into a, a shell script. Uh, and uh, I think there was already a little bit of discussion about figuring out potentially a way to be able to put those into the bro package system and be able to share all of these other little tools that we're all using every day to to hash up and, and cut up and, and look through logs. Um, I, I was, during, during your question, at first I was a little lost because I was thinking, um, I wasn't sure who answered last year, but I think I know why you got the answer you did. Um, Operationally could, could mean a couple of, like running bro operationally could mean how do I just mechanically get this working and, and running? And then also what do I actually do once it's mechanically working and running? And, and um, the, the two are definitely different. I suspect the reason you got the answer you did last year was um, if you go to try.bro.org and you put a PCAP file in, it gives you all the logs. So it's like a way, it was a way of sort of short circuiting the need to actually do anything other than just go to a website and upload a PCAP and be done with it and just look at it in the web browser. Um, but no, I, I, that's, uh, that's, that's tough. It's, it's sort of been like uh, bro training has always been difficult. I mean, I know I've done it a number of times and um, it's always hard because there's so many aspects to it. And I know there was one time uh, years ago for higher ed, I actually did a training and it was all programming based. But it was before Bro 2.0 and it was like impossible to run Bro. And I was like, I am not going to describe how to get this thing running because it was so hard to do. And, and so I ended up doing programming and just completely missed the mark on what people needed. Mm. Unfortunately, at the time, I couldn't actually teach what they needed because it was hard, so hard. I just couldn't put together material to do that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, there was a period of time we had a bro training group that was, so the idea was to sort of share training materials and then make like a shared body of training materials. It kind of fizzled out and it's been shut down now, but um, yeah, and, and I don't know. We've tried a number of things. You can look back through there, time and there's see. There's something new coming now. I'm not ready to announce quite yet, but we're trying to encourage people to do some training materials. The thing is, it's so much effort. It's not something people want to give away for free. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap this up now. I'm sorry. There's, unless the panel has, do you have time for one more? I'm, Robin's the one who has to catch a flight. Oh, you have a flight soon? I guess. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> let, let's let them go and thank the panel then. <laughs> thank you. Um, also, I want to make sure we thank Jeanette. This has been a wonderful thing. She's done so much work.